While most of the attention in the US presidential elections will be focused on the Republican and Democratic parties, in the event of a close-run affair, the impact of independent candidates could be vital. And as mentioned in our debate, one name in the ring this time has a familiar ring to it. Kennedy, one of the most famous names in American politics. Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s father, Bobby, and his uncle, President John F. Kennedy, were both assassinated when he was a boy. But now RFK Jr. has quit the Democratic Party and announced he will run as an independent candidate for president. I caught up with him at a rally in the city of Raleigh in North Carolina. Mr. Kennedy, great to have you join us for this. Thanks for your time. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming all the way out it's here. It's a pleasure. Uh, I should explain, by the way, uh, at the beginning, just for those who uh, in, in our global audience, which is very wide, who may not have heard you speak, that you have an unusual condition uh, in terms of it, the way it makes your voice sound, uh, known as uh, spasmodic dysphonia. So if they're curious. That, yeah, I, I had a very, very strong voice till I was 42 years old. And then in 1996, I got a, uh, a, a neurological injury. So my voice, the, the strangeness that you hear in my voice is not actually coming from my vocal cords, but it's uh, my brain sending the wrong signals to my vocal cords. But anyway, it's, I, it's hard for people to listen to a lot. But I just wanted to explain. To it. All right. So let's start by asking how your campaign is going at this stage. I mean, if you judge by my poll numbers, my campaign is going very well. The Gallup poll that came out shows me at, with the highest favorability rating of any other candidate. In fact, I'm 10 points behind, about 10 points in front of either uh, President Biden or President Trump. Um, and then the, uh, the recent polling by high gravitas polls, uh, like the Harvard Harris poll, New York Times Siena poll, shows me out polling President Biden and President Trump among all Americans under 45 years old and among independents, which is now the biggest voting group. Interestingly enough, you're also in the unfavorable ratings lowest, so you're actually really kicking it there too. Yeah, I'm, up, I'm above water. I don't know why that is because literally I went, a reason I went about a decade of my life when I was involved in vaccine safety advocacy with, with thousands of articles written about me and all of them negative. So I, to me, it's encouraging somehow that somehow my favorability has survived that. I'll get onto some of the issues that you're, you're standing for in a moment, but your strategy seems to be ballot access. That's to get you on every ballot across the country. And I'm wondering, you know, how challenging that's proving to be, especially as you're running as, a, as an independent. Well, we're just starting out that battle. I have to get each day we have 50 states in the, British, in the District of Columbia. And they all have different rules, and they're very arcane and Byzantine and, and uh, complex. So, uh, but I, in total, I have to get a million signatures. President Biden and President Trump will be on those, uh, all those ballots for free. Uh, but for me, I need to organize grassroots efforts to get those signatures. And we're doing that, you know, we're, and we're way ahead of, of where we uh, uh, projected. Uh, so getting the signatures is turning out to be easier. I think in the long run, it's, pro it's paradoxically going to put me in a stronger position because it's forcing us to develop a very, very good ground game very early in the election. President Biden, President Trump are probably not going to really focus on their ground game till next August. And then they have two months to put it together. But I will be building our army. We already have 50,000 volunteers in the field and many, many more coming in every day. So how much of a disadvantage is it to you that you've never held political office? I know you've considered it a number of times, but especially as politics is one of those uh, areas in which those relationships that are built over long term uh, periods of time are important. Well, I had those relationships because my family name and access. I burned a lot of those relationships during the uh, COVID pandemic by going against the orthodoxies. Um, but in terms of the voters, uh, I think it's an advantage to not be, you know, the, the, uh, in, in most people's minds in this country, what's happening inside of the Beltway is, uh, is I, I, I'm, I'm not gonna use the word corrupt, but is, uh, uh, is distasteful. So oh, I, I don't think I, I don't think me not having had a long career in politics is going to help me. And I've been on the periphery of politics since the day I was born.
It seems you've heavily courted, though, the right-wing and libertarian media appearing on a lot of the shows and, and podcasts of, of those uh, key figures. And I wonder to what extent you're limiting yourself there, then. Well, that's not a strategic choice for me. I'll go on anybody who lets me go on. Oh, it's the, the liberal media, the CNN, MSNBC, will not let me appear in an interview. They'll do, occasionally, they'll do a taped interview with me, but they'll no, never do anything live. It's, you know, it's, politics is considered a dirty business, I think, all across the world. And your, your opponents will use every opportunity to target you, whether it's your views, as we'll get onto in, in a minute, more of your views. But also, for example, that you, you know, had drug addiction when you were younger. It went on for a few years. Uh, and, and were actually, uh, you know, arrested and convicted for that. How much are those kind of weapons against you going to be effective in, in, in limiting what you can achieve? Well, I don't think that particular, um, that, that particular episode in my life is going to end up hurting me because every American family, you know, I've been, uh, I, I got sober uh, 40 years ago. And I'm very open about my sobriety, so it's not something that I, and about my addiction. The 14 years that I was a heroin addict, I talk about it openly. I think people, it's important for people to hear about that. I think it's important for people to hear stories of recovery. And my impression is that that's not, um, it's, you know, there's so many Americans that have now been touched by addiction in our family. It's one of the largest causes of death. Last year, we lost 106,000 kids in our country from drug overdoses. That's double the number that we lost in the 20-year Vietnam War. Um, and I talk about the, you know, from, from being in recovery a long time, I, I understand the, the, um, the challenges and the difficulties, but also the opportunity to heal other Americans whose lives have been touched by this as well. So I'm very open about talking about that. And I don't get the impression that it uh, turns people, voters against me, but I don't know. I mean, my choice, I said at the beginning of this, when I announced eight months ago, I said the entire population has been subject to a, a medical experiment for three years. And I'm now going to do a mass experiment on the, on the American public, which is an experiment in truth telling. I'm going to be honest with myself, honest about the problems in this country, honest about the challenges. And uh, if there's an appetite for that, I'll win. If there's no appetite, then I'll lose. And I'll, I'll, either way, I'll be okay. You're behind a, a quite a diverse range of issues um, that draw from both camps, the, what the Republicans stand for, what the Democrats stand for. And I'm wondering that uh, as a result, it's possible that you might actually dent both sides. But then it also might make you more a facilitator for one or the other rather than a viable candidate for yourself. What, what are your worries about that? I, I don't worry about that. My, my intention is to win the election. Oh, you know, there's 60, I think 61 percent um, of the American public in the most recent poll does not want President Biden or President Trump as president. They don't want that contest. These are the two most unpopular candidates ever to run in America, the entire span of American history since polls started uh, to run as the candidate for a major political party, both of them. So, you know, I... Um, I think Americans deserve a choice, a, a, a more of a choice than just the lesser of two evils, that there should be other opportunities for them, that they should have, they, you know, they're entitled to somebody who's going to inspire them to make them believe in our country again. And I don't think they're getting that from the two political parties. If stuck with either of those, if it came to that, which would be the, the worst? I, I, I don't have a plan B. I'm, I'm in, intending to win this election. <laughs> So let's look at some of the key issues you're highlighting as important for you in your campaign. The first being immigration. Um, what, what your camp often sees as a border crisis. Um, considering that the United States is a country of immigrants, I wonder how you, you know, that, that's such a main issue uh, and what you plan to do about it. Well, we ought to have, you know, America is a welcoming country. We ought to have wide gates, but also high walls. We need to, we can't be having 7 million people come across the border um, without any regulation. Uh, you know, people wait in line and they make their applications and we, we need immigrants in this country. We, we've got a social security system that 
needs a new generation of workers in order to uh, keep it solvent. But we, we as a nation, like every other nation, need to be able to control our borders and control our immigration policies. So that, you know, that's, I think that's basic. That, that shouldn't be a radical idea. And, and you know, I went down to the border. I watched, uh, we're now getting 14,000 people a day come across with, uh, you know, no plan. And it, it's unnecessary. I watched 300 people come across between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. at Yuma, Arizona. And the Border Patrol's job now has devolved into just simply driving them to the airport and putting them on a plane to any destination they want in the United States. The, the drug cartels manage the, the immigration policies. So they, they, they were coming in on buses that are owned by the Sinaloa cartel. And they're paying the cartel $10,000 a piece to get them to the border. And it's, a, it's an insane, insane policy. No country in the world would let that happen, and we shouldn't either. So what's the most viable solution then? What could really be effective? Well, there, there are many things that we could be doing. We could shut it off overnight if we had political will. You need to end the catch and release program. You need to, we need to uh, have enough asylum court judges. So that those cases are adjudicated before people step into our country. Once they step in, they have an asylum claim and they can stay here until it's fully adjudicated. So you need to adjudicate it before they come across. And this kind of runaway immigration feeds on itself because everybody now in the world knows. I mean, the, the people who were coming across the night that I went there knew exactly what was going to happen to them because the drug cartels are advertising on TikTok and YouTube and telling them, here's exactly what's going to happen to you. You pay us the money, we'll pick you up at Mexico City Airport, we'll get you a local visa, we'll put you on a local plane to Mexicali, we'll pick you up in the parking lot at Mexicali and buses, we'll bring you to the border, you will be escorted across and brought to the Yuma Airport. And they're doing this up and down the border, and it, there's never been a migration like this an illegal migration into an unwilling country ever in the history of human beings um, that we know of, of any state um, of this size. I have quite a bit to cover with you, so, so let me ask you about this. You say you want to end proxy wars, bombing campaigns, covert operations, coups, paramilitaries, and everything else that has become so normal that most people don't know what's happening. And you believe the, Demo the Democratic Party has become the party of war, blaming President Biden. I think both parties are the party of war. So many argue the USA military machine has always been at the heart of this country's system and that it's not something you can overturn or change in an easy way. How would you do that? Uh, I will wind down the empire abroad. We have now 800 bases abroad and each one of those is picking a fight with somebody. And, um, you know, the Russians have a one, one, maybe two bases. The Chinese have one or two bases abroad. Uh, we spend 10 times on our military. We spend more on our military than the next 10 nations combined. And we've spent $8 trillion on useless wars since 2001. And, you know, look what we've gotten for it. The whole world is in chaos because of that. I mean, let, let me just go through what the costs of war of Iraq. We left Iraq worse off than we found it. We killed more Iraqis than Saddam Hussein. Um, Iraq today is a, 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 a battle, an incoherent nation with a battle between Shia and Sunni death squads. It has become a proxy for Iran, which is why all this other chaos is breaking out with the Houthis, because Iraq once counterbalanced Iran's power in the region. It doesn't exist anymore. We wiped that out. We created ISIS. We drove, with the Syrian spillover war, we drove two million refugees into Europe which destabilized all the democracies in Europe for the next two or three generations. Brexit is probably a direct result of our intervention in Iraq, you know, in that way. And uh, what's happening in France now with the rioting, et cetera, is all traceable to our Iraq war. So that's what we got. And, and meanwhile, the American middle class is falling off a cliff. I was at my uncle's inauguration in 1961. Three days before he was inaugurated as president, John F. Kennedy, Dwight Eisenhower, the outgoing president, gave a speech, in which, the, which probably now should be regarded as the most important speech in American history, where he warned America against the emergence 
of a military industrial complex that would turn us into an imperium abroad and a national security state at home and put the weapons manufacturers in charge of American democracy. And today that's exactly what has happened. And you know, we are addicted to this pipeline of new wars that are being driven. You look who's who's funding both the Democratic and Republican Party. It's Raytheon, General Dynamics, Northrop Grumman, Boeing, and Lockheed. And they need to put NATO in every country in Europe because then that new country has to uh, adopt NATO uh, weapons purchase specifications. And it's a guaranteed market for those countries. It's all a big money laundering project, uh, which, you know, we need to unleash ourselves from. So some might see some irony in the fact that you're anti-war and anti-interventionist, and yet you believe there should be no call for a ceasefire. Uh, in the Israel-Hamas situation, uh, ending the, the ongoing military campaign by Israel in Gaza. And that's being described by genocide uh, in some quarters. So how can you justify that? Well, it's not genocide. It's a, it's a war. And in fact, Israel does more to prevent civilian casualties than any country in human history. And if you look what they've done in Gaza, which is to warn people before they bomb. Nobody else does that. They've sent out 1.2 million pamphlets. They, they make, they've made 20,000 telephone, direct human-to-human -human telephone calls to people before they bomb apartment building. They, uh, they've sent out, they've, they've made 1.2 million robocalls to everybody who's about to get bombed. They do, uh, they send roof knocker bombs, which they invented Avoid, but they're fighting against an implacable foe, which is vowed to, for, to uh, committed to a genocide of Israel that does not want to negotiate, that has violated every ceasefire that they, that, that has, uh, the five ceasefires before they violated every one of them. They, they have said we will not be content with any result other than a genocide of the Jews and the annihilation of Israel. How can you negotiate with that group? I don't, you know, I believe wars are, are wrong. And there, since in American history, the last uh, war that we fought that was justified was World War II. World War I was not. We should never have gotten into it. And none of the wars since World War II. But this, you know, Israel's not asking us for troops. They're asking us for, for support. And by the way, the support that we've given Israel is mainly to construct the Iron Dome, which is a, a, a mechanism for avoiding the invasion of Gaza. Because Gaza, Hamas has shot 30,000 rockets at Israel since 2006, at, at, at civilian populations in Israel. Even it's part of the propaganda war that, that Gaza has the densest population in the world. It doesn't. Tel Aviv has twice the population density as Gaza, and Gaza's been firing missiles at civilian populations for 30 years. What other country in the world would we ask to put up with that? And the Israelis do, why? How do they do it? They built an iron dome but it's, it's, that it's allows serious, them. It's still a unique situation where you have the people in Gaza who don't have freedom of movement. Oh, but but why, do, why are you blaming the Israelis for that? Uh, it's, the, not, it's, the, it's Hamas that has given them no, no freedom of movement. Hamas has turned Gaza into an open air prison, not Israel. Israel didn't do that. The outcome, the outcome still, that what we're seeing right now is tens well, of Well, of course, thousands. you know, the outcome in World War II when we invaded Germany and killed two million civilians in order to get Hitler. You know, Churchill didn't want to do that. Churchill wanted, Churchill and Roosevelt argued at Casablanca, and Roosevelt said, we need unconditional surrender, because as long as the Nazis were there, it's going to be a war-making machine, and they'll grow up again. And uh, Churchill said, yeah, but if we make unconditional surrender, they're going to fight to the death, and there's going to be a lot of civilians. Roosevelt said, over the long run, it's a better outcome for everybody. And indeed, that's what happened. We did the same thing in Japan, the same thing in Germany. We denazified them. Uh, Israel needs to de-radicalize Gaza so that the money that we've poured into Gaza, Gaza's now... It's, it's going to be the opposite effect. If you've got generations now seeing what's been happening, the, the Palestinians... It's already... It, 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 that's not Israel's fault. That is the, the ideology that Gaza teaches children from when they're born, from the, when they're toddlers. But they're taught still, that the, the highest aspiration 
of a Palestinian is to slit the throat of a Jew. But, you know, they're so taught the that from when they're yeah. little babies. So, of course, you know, the, what we saw on October 7th, the level of brutality, an entire group of people that had the morality of serial killers where they're cooking babies in ovens. I, I, so I don't think any, you cannot get yeah. worse than that. I that only it, comes from indoctrinating children from when they're little I babies. I don't think anyone's questioning that. Uh, what I'm getting at, though, is that Essentially, the, the Palestinians have to go through border checkpoints. They have a different situation. So it's their it own country. And, and listen, God, uh, they had an open border in Gaza until Hamas took over. Hamas had suicide bo bo bombers across the border. What, do you, what would you think would happen, Mr. Khan, if, um, if Mexico sent 30,000, said, you know, we elected a government that said, we're going to uh, reclaim Texas? And they sent 30,000 rockets onto San Antonio. And they sent suicide bombers across so to I'm kill not, Americans. I'm, I'm, Would, do you think we'd put up a fence? I, I'm not defending Hamas, sir. That's not the, the question. I'm just yeah, I'm but curious you, about but your perspective. You're, you're blaming Israel. I'm not for, blaming anyone. I'm just questioning what your perspective is on this. Because, yeah. for example, you said, um, you know, Palestinians are the most pampered people in the world. I was just trying to get your perspective. All right, right. let me answer that. Please. I, I'm saying that because, not because Palestinians have a good life. I'm pro-Palestinian. I'm as pro-Palestinian as you can get. I'm anti-Hamas. Hamas has robbed the Palestinian people. The international aid community, well, the United States, after World War II, get, uh, created the Marshall Plan, and we rebuilt 17 nations in Europe that were destroyed by World War II. We gave an average payment of $48 per capita in, in $1948. It's about $621 per capita today. We have already funneled to the 5 million Palestinians an average of $8,600 per capita, more than 13 times what we did to recreate, uh, to, to rebuild all of Europe. What's happened to that money? The Palestinians are worse off and they started because that money is being stolen by Hamas, which is a like, organized crime cartel and a corporate kleptocracy. Ismail Nahania, who's the head of Hamas, has a net worth of $5 billion. The top three leaders of Hamas have a net worth of, of uh, $11 billion collectively. Mahmoud Abbas has a billion dollars. His son has $750 million each. Yasser Arafat on a billion. So they're stealing them. They're using that money, that international aid money, for two reasons. One, to build weapons, 300 miles, entire underground city, 300 miles of tunnels, to buy, to buy Kalashnikovs, to buy bombs, to buy drones, to kill Jews with. That's it. Hamas is the enemy of the people of Palestine and, and uh, not, you know, not Israel. If you're at the helm in the White House right now, how would you be handling the Israeli-Palestinian situation? What would you do? I would be... On the phone, I I would have a different relationship with with the world leaders like Xi, like Putin, um, like Sisi in Egypt. I think this that there is a chance for peace, short of the complete annihilation of Hamas, if all the other uh, world leaders and the world community came together to support Israel and said, we're going to help you solve this problem. But that's not what happened. Unfortunately, they left Israel on its own. And at that point, Israel doesn't have any, any options except to destroy Hamas. So, and, you know, I, I'm not a fan of Prime Minister Netanyahu. And most Israelis aren't either. Most Israelis no longer support him. But they do support this policy because there is no future for Israel if they don't destroy Hamas. In order to cover a number of issues with you, sir, as I know time is limited, let me ask you about the Russia-Ukraine situation. You described the, uh, that invasion of Ukraine as a proxy war between Russia and the U.S. Can you yeah. Give perspective? Well, it's a proxy war. I mean, the, the, the real fulcrum of the war is over the extension of NATO into, into Ukraine and the extension of NATO across all of Europe. We agreed in 1992 when Gorbachev moved his troops out of, Russian troops out of, um, East Germany and allowed us to reunify East Germany under, uh, under, uh, under NATO, we agreed not to move NATO to the east. And since then, we've moved it into 14 countries. We put Aegis missile systems, which are nuclear capable in Poland and Romania. 
We could deliver nuclear payrolls loads to Moscow within 12 minutes, so we could decapitate the entire Soviet leadership in 12 minutes. We walked away from the two nuclear weapons treaty, the intermediate treaty that we had signed. We unilaterally walked away. Naturally, Putin has national security anxieties, the same ones that my uncle had when the Russians put Soviet missiles in Cuba. I'm not making excuses for Putin. Putin had other options, and you know, Putin is who Putin is, and I'm not a supporter of Putin's. And my uncle always said, you have to put your, guy, your shoe yourself in the other guy's shoes. And that has not happened here. Nobody, you know, our, our greatest diplomats, George Cannon, who was the architect of the containment policy during the Cold War, Bill Pierce, who was the head of the CIA, uh, Bill Parry, who was the uh, U.S. ambassador to the Soviet Union, all said, we're going to resign if you move NATO into Ukraine because you're forcing the Russians into a violent response. Now, I'll just say this. The Russians two times have come to the negotiating table and worked out term seats with, sheets with President Zelensky that they were ready to sign. And in both cases, the U.S., torpedoed those agreements, one in April of 2022, and the other was the Minsk Accords. And we forced Zelensky not to sign those agreements. I'm going to ask you, as we're running out of time, I'm going to ask you about the home front now, the U.S. Uh, view. In the USA, gun violence uh, obviously raises its ugly head uh, regularly. Um, that's, a, that's an issue you have to deal with. The, uh, uh, you're also Divergent from the MAGA, the Make American America Great Again movement on that front and abortion, affirmative action, what, what is your, your perspective? How will you win over the voter base? That, that, that's very well, strong. I, I, I'm not going to talk about winning over the voter base. I'm talking about staying true to my principles. And I fought for medical freedom for as, far, as hard as anybody in the world, I would say, that people ought to have autonomy over their own bodies, that a government shouldn't be telling people what to do. And I think... Every abortion is a tragedy. Nobody wants to have one, but the uh, choice should not be left for the government. We have to trust women. We have to trust the mothers on that issue. Uh, on the gun issue, we have a Second Amendment in this country. I believe in the Constitution. The Supreme Court has, uh, has given a very, very expansive reading of the Second Amendment so that it's almost impossible to regulate guns. I'm not going to take anybody's guns away as president. I, I will say this. We ought to be investigating the reason the, the school shootings in this country, the mass shootings are unacceptable. And we need to be investigating why they're happening in this country. Why are we alone? Um, why is that happening? This? Why did it never happen before? Two of the culprits that ought to be investigated, and I'm not saying that we know this, but one is SSRIs, the, the widespread use of now of these, this class of psychiatric drugs that has a black box label on it saying may cause homicidal and suicidal uh, behavior. Um, and we now have a large part of the American population on those. The other is, you know, other issues like video games. NIH, the National Institute of Health, ought to be studying what are, why is it that Switzerland, which has comparable levels of guns, has not had a mass shooting in 21 years, and we have one every 21 hours. Why is that? That is, you know, when I was a kid, kids my age were bringing their rifles to schools for shooting clubs. Nobody ever blinked at that. Nobody ever started shooting at other children in the schools. It just did never happen before. This is unique in, in human history, and we need to be studying that. Since 1996, NIH has had a policy not to study the ideology or the origins of gun violence, and I'm going to change that. As, as just a final question, are you staying off the issue of vaccination and all the controversial issues, vaccination, 5G telecoms causing brain cancer now as you go? No, I, I talk about those issues with anybody who wants to. They're not issues that I lead with. But as you know, I won a case on the uh, dangers of, of Wi-Fi, of, of cell phone radiation. I won the F Federal Court of Appeals, the United States uh, Circuit Court forcing FCC to go back for uh, rebuking them for lying to the American public about claims that uh, cell phone radiation was safe at the levels currently regulated. There's other states that are now banning them. In terms of vaccines, I'm happy to talk about anything anybody wants to talk about, but it's not something that I'm lead. That is one of the, my major campaign issues. 
Well, Mr. Kennedy, thank you for giving up time at a busy phase in your life, and I hope you'll give me some more time because there's so much to discuss with you. I look forward to it, I hope. Thank you, Riz. I enjoyed our conversation. Thank you, sir. Thank you to all my guests, Rick Wilson, Mark Lotter, and Robert F. Kennedy, Jr. We'll take a look at Joe Biden's Democratic campaign and bring you more engaging conversations from the U.S. elections, as well as a broad range of important global issues in upcoming episodes of The Riz Khan Show. I'll see you then. From me and the team here in Washington, D.C., thanks for watching.